It is the morning of the 5th of April 1987 and traffic is light across the School Hurry Creek Bridge, New York State. Rain has been falling for a couple of days and the water level along the creek was rising. Without any real warning, a section of the bridge over the creek plunges into the flowing water below. The disaster would force a rethink of bridge design, maintenance and how water flow can cause a sudden and catastrophic disaster. Welcome to Plainly Difficult. My name is John and today we're looking at the School Harry Creek Bridge Collapse. Background This video was prompted by recent events in Baltimore. Of course, being the content hunter I am and giving me something to research in the meantime, I started looking at other bridge-based tragedies. This leads us on to today's bridge, one of the spans over the Schoolhurry Creek. The need to cross the creek has been one that dates back to the early 1820s with the construction and operation of an aqueduct for the Erie Canal, with the original being replaced in the 1840s. This was a few miles away from today's disaster zone, but it shows the creek was an obstruction that needed to be overcome. The creek had a nasty sting, which would cause the demise of a few crossings, and this was its propensity to flood on the odd occasion. Rainwater ran off into the roughly 83 mile long creek, which in turn flowed into the river Mohawk. Further upstream, the creek is dammed in two different places. The creek over the years would flood and in 1940 would take down the Erie Canal viaduct after a roughly 100 year lifespan. The canal had ceased operations and thus maintenance in 1917. Needless to say, the creek will get you. Now this leads us on to our main focus of today's video, the Schoolhurry Creek Bridge. Designed in 1952 and constructed in 1954, it was originally meant to be a three lane highway in each way, although in actual use it only had two wider lanes in each direction during its operation. The bridge carried the New York State Thruway. It consisted of five spans of concrete reinforced decking, sat atop steel supporting bars, which were then themselves held up by reinforced concrete columns on top of concrete piers. Just a few years after opening, four of the five concrete plimps were found to have cracks. This was in 1957. The remedy was to pour an additional layer of concrete over as a cap. Interestingly, this was discovered two years after one of the creek's worst floods. The flood of 1955 was bad. Floods would happen in the area over the following decades, but nothing would come close until 1987, and this time it would prove to be deadly. The disaster. The start of April 1987 was a wet one. Rain had been falling for the best part of a week, amassing over 7 inches of rainfall. As such, the creek had begun to fill up, and the ground was sodden and saturated. And to add watery insult to injury, the nearby Catskill Mountain snow had begun to melt, which then also ran off into the creek. The water levels in the creek were becoming alarming, so much so, as said in the later NTSB report, the NWS issued at least seven flood statements and six flood warnings at through the 5th of April 1987 to advise the public of the rising water and flood conditions along the Schoolhurry Creek Basin. Weather warnings were relayed via local news agencies to the public. People were made aware of the rising water levels, and by the 5th of April, most had decided that driving around in the terrible weather wasn't such an ideal plan. As such, over the Schoolhurry Bridge, traffic was light to moderate at around half ten in the morning. Funnily enough, this morning the rain had been fairly light and not really affecting any issues with visibility. Witnesses would later say of the morning that apart from the higher creek waterline, all else seemed pretty average. At 10.40am in the morning, a police state trooper made the crossing and would later report that all seemed well. However, just five minutes later, a disaster would strike. Volunteers working nearby observing the water in the creek heard a loud bang. Pier 3 of the bridge had collapsed, sending two spans plummeting into the water, some 80 feet below. Two eastbound vehicles, which was a car and a truck, fell into the void. Two more eastbound and a westbound car 
would also drive off the edge. The cars, now in the fast-flowing creek, sunk beneath the water. Some of the luckier following cars managed to stop and drivers got out to start flagging down other vehicles in an effort to try and save more lives. The first calls came in to emergency services around 10.48 in the morning. This was from a toll booth operator and the volunteers watching the creek. Police were dispatched and arrived on scene at roughly 10.50 in the morning. They started clearing the bridge and police began searching the creek's banks. The emergency response was swift but of the 10 missing people inside the stricken vehicles, none would be seen alive. Nine bodies were pulled out from the water, leaving one more missing and presumed drowned. Around 90 minutes after the initial collapse, Pier 2 also collapsed, plunging another span into the water, which rather fascinatingly was actually captured by local news reporters. Search efforts would continue along until the 12th of April and would include divers and around 40 emergency personnel. Now, the bridge collapse would cause severe issues in the region with traffic needing to detour. The collapse was rather high profile, due to in part of it being caught on TV. To add more disaster to the area, another bridge further upstream also collapsed a few days later. But thankfully, it had been close to traffic as a precaution. So, it being a road-based disaster, our investigators today are the NTSB. The Investigation Bridges collapsing aren't meant to be a regular occurrence. For some reason, multiple structures had failed along the Schoolhurry Creek over the years. The Freeway Authority would commission its own investigation in addition to the NTSB. This would result in a physical model in order to undertake scale hydraulic experiments. Divers were employed to recover any debris of the bridge. In addition to this, coffer dams were constructed around the bridge's columns. This allowed a rare view of the structure devoid of water. Investigators discovered that piers 2 and 3 had separated. They found the riverbed had eroded away from the base of the piers. After interviewing witnesses, it was discovered that Pier 3 had failed first. This in combination with the erosion around the upstream face of the lower part of the bridge's support. This led the NTSB to set out and investigate a couple of failure modes, including failure of the superstructure first, but the cause was most likely a scour. A scour is when sediment around a bridge abutment or pier is eroded away, which after enough time and material loss would undermine the structure's foundations. This problem is more common in an area that has strong fast flowing currents, like what the Schoolhurry Creek was known for. So what can be done to fix it? Well, you can use this thing called riprap. It's man deposited rocks or pebbles and acts as a rock shield against sediment erosion. The NTSB would summarise their findings in their 1988 report into the collapse. The National Transport Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the collapse of the Schoolhurry Creek Bridge was the failure of the New York State Freeway Authority to maintain adequate riprap around the bridge's piers, which led to severe erosion in the soil beneath the spread footings. Contributing to the accident were ambiguous plans and specifications used for construction of the bridge, an inadequate NYSTA bridge inspection program and inadequate oversight by the New York State Department of Transport and the Federal Highway Administration. Contributing to the severity of the accident was a lack of structural redundancy in the bridge. All pretty damning to everyone involved. It would seem that from the day the bridge was built, the countdown to disaster had already begun with the creek's bed beginning to scour and this would be a 35 year journey of it wearing away to ultimate failure. The state would have to pay out on several lawsuits brought by the victims' families, which would result in various settlements totaling an estimated $4 million. The state would then later file suit against the bridge's designer for a $600,000 settlement. They had also sought to file against the contractor, but the statute of limitations had already passed. $4.6 million for 10 lives doesn't really seem like a great deal for the victims. So it's scale time. It's going to be a free on my disaster scale, and this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Play Default production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. 
Blade Foot videos are produced by me, John, in the currently wet and windy corner of Southern London, UK. I have YouTube and Patreon members, so thank you very much for your financial support. And I also have a second channel, a band camp, a Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, and an Instagram, which is for all my other odds and sods and bits and pieces I get up to while I'm not thinking and talking about disasters. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and Mr. Music, play us out, please. Mm -hmm.